Okay. <coughs> okay. We've got a busy schedule today. So the good news is bad news. Okay, go on. The bad news is it's another six page hand. The good news is we covered some of it last week, so probably only <laughs> I skipped the video today. Not to mention, there's not too many good, funny videos on Christ's return. You need to create one. You gotta have the good. I know. It's like, it's like my youth group. They can't meet unless there's a funny video. Okay. We're going to be, uh, for those who have missed, um, you know, Revelation 119, and I keep doing this each week, not because I know many of you know this, but I want to drill it into your minds, so that when someone asks you, or the topic comes up about Revelation, you immediately go in your head, well, I know three things about Revelation. I know that it's outlined in Revelation 119 where Jesus told John to write the things that you see, the things that are, and the things that take place after these things. So those are the three things, right? And the first thing, the things that you see, was John's vision. The things that are was the church period, the church period we're in now, right? And the things that take place after these, that's at the end of the church period, right? So it's, it's pretty simple logic through. You should be able to do an elevator speech on Revelation or when you see bad theology which is going to happen. You're going to see some people with some really crazy ideas and interpretations of Revelation or they're just going to simply say you're going to be talking with them and they're going to say well I studied Revelation oh you did that book? That book's so hard. It's so hard to understand. No one understands. No, look, it's really simple. There's only three things. And you have a conversation with them, open them up to you, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do that. Now, having said that, um, we went through that. We went through uh, chapter 4, which was the throne room, and God grabbing the seal, the title D, remember? And then we saw the seals and the Antichrist come out. Remember on a white horse, bow, no arrow? We're going to see the real Christ come out this week because we're going to pick up on chapter 19. Christ's return. Then we went through after the seals, we went through the trumpets, and we went through the bowl. Okay? You all remember the symbolism of the seals and the trumpet? And the bowl? You what? You what? The seals. Amen. What did the seals denote in Jewish culture? Would the king have on his or state? Right? The seals had the royal authority, right? Yeah. And they were sealed, and the more important the document, the more seals. And we know the significance of seven, right? God's number is perfect. Seven seals. It's a very important document, right? The title D. With the trumpets, what was seven blows of the trumpet? What was significant about that? Mm -hmm. Right. It was all twelve tribes moving. Okay. God's people were on the moon. And the bowls, what was the significance of the bowls? What were the bowls used? All right. But in Israel, what were they used? And specifically with the tabernacle? They carried the blood. Right, they carried the blood, right? So the Day of Atonement, right, the holy high priest would come in with a bowl, and the bowl would be poured out as the sin offering to cover the sins of the people, right? once a year, right? Okay. So in this case, the bowls are for the people that have rejected the blood of Christ and they're filled with wrath. And so <laughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> last week you made it through Revelation. Congratulations. Or the Great Tribulation. Congratulations. So this week we're going to pick up... Now, I kind of went through this fast and I don't think I quite did it justice, so I'm going to kind of pick up here with uh, Revelation 7 
through nine, if someone can read that, because I'm going to revisit this. Who wants to read? Check your notes. 19, 19, seven through nine. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given uh, her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited into the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the words of God. Okay. So what we talked about, big picture, we talked about the wedding supper, right? This was the bride and Christ right? The bride and the groom, the marriage of the church, right? Which has been forecasted since the beginning, right? Uh, we have marriage as an institution to model that relationship, right? So it finally is occurring. And then what is the bride adorned for? Can we talk about this. What adorns the bride? The, the righteous acts, right? So we talked about that. So I wanted to put this into context. So if someone can read, I'll put it here out by 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 15, if you want to read that. On page 80. By the grace God has given me, I laid the foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, the work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring light to it. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. And if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will have been saved, even though only as one escaping through the flame. Okay, does this clearly explain what we're talking about? What we're talking about is when the bride comes, they're going to be adorned with a righteous act. So what you have done in this life that you did for Jesus, right, that was of eternal value will make it through the fire, Right? The things that you did, some of us do it even in Jesus' name, but we don't do it for the right motivation. And even if it, you did it in his name, but you didn't do it for the right motivations, it's not going to make it through the fire, right? So only the things of eternal value will go through the fire. That is the judgment for us as Christians for the church. It's the Bema seat judgment. It's the judgment seat of Christ, okay? We're going to cover this a little bit later, but this is kind of where it occurs for the church. So I wanted to be clear on that because there was a little confusion last time. And I had a couple of questions after, and I think I covered it too fast. Okay. Do you have questions on that? None? Okay. Clear? Okay. Okay. Let's go on. Um, we talked about um, verse 10, which was... Uh, kind of an eyewitness admission of John, right? I love these verses. This happens three or four times in the book of Revelation. But this is John bowing down to an angel instead of Christ, right? So once again, this is an eyewitness account. If you were going to fictitiously write this or someone to say that Revelation isn't true, you know, if you were going to do it, you wouldn't put yourself down. So John is painfully honest, right? Admitting that he's bowing down to an angel. Okay, and then 19, 11 through 16, who wants to read Christ's return? I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. 
on his robe and on his thigh he had this writ this name written king of kings and lord of lords okay now let me read chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 when the first seal was popped off so you can know the difference okay now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, come and see. And look, I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. He went out conquering and to conquer. Do you see the difference between these two descriptions? So when people tell you that this is Jesus in chapter 6, when the seal opens, you need to point them to this verse. And you say, how do you reconcile this difference? Right? There are two different images here. I'll put it in your chart here. If you'll look on the next page, right? The writer, there's no description. Okay? If this is really Jesus, and the book is about Jesus, do you think they would have described him a little bit more than a writer? Okay? Whereas we have the names of God here, right? Faithful and true, the word of God, King of kings, Lord of lords. We have a white horse. And then in Revelation 19, he and the armies of God are on white horses, right? This is the whole cavalry coming. And by the way, you all will be on one of those white horses too, right? If you're the church, you're going to be riding out. It's pretty astonishing. We talked about that before. This is like that home project that you do with your kids at Home Depot, you know, where you practically put it together and then they grab the hammer and they kind of halfway hit the bench and not even the nail. And then you go, you did a good job, you know? That's gonna be us. You know, I'm gonna be riding on my little white Shetland pony and Jesus will be on, you know, the Clydesdale going through with a sword out of his mouth, right? And I'll be given the BB gun, right? Because he knows that's about all I can handle, right? You know? <clears throat> okay. A bow with no arrows, right? That's what Revelation 6 says. Revelation 19. Eyes blazing like fire, and out of his mouth a sharp sword. Okay? A crown given versus many crowns. Okay? Conquer and bent on conquest versus... Just as he wages war and treads the wine press and rules with an iron scepter. Okay? There's a big difference between these two things. So don't let people lead you astray. Okay? Okay. Why is it significant that Jesus has a sword coming out of his mouth and what does that mean to us? Right. What does Ephesians say? About the armor of God. Sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Right. And out of in Ephesians 6, when Paul is describing the armor of God, which one is the offensive weapon? It's the only one, right? All the other ones we have. Right? We only have one weapon. Right? So that's why we study the word. Because if you don't have that, you got no game. Right? You're done. Okay. Um, why did Jesus' people not recognize him in the first coming? What is the difference between his first coming and his second coming? Why do you think? I'll put a chart there. But why do you think they didn't recognize him? They come out looking like a king. They want to the king. The time they really was under Roman oppression. That they were interested in the world. They wanted the white horse. They saw these same prophecies, right? But they, their vision, their mind was on, I want him on a white horse. I don't want that suffering guy. Right? I don't want the humble, right? I want him on a white horse. But we don't do that, right? We don't choose the type of Jesus we want. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure. Uh, 
Okay, the four Gospels. The four Gospels correspond to the four names used here. Um, Matthew was the kingly Gospel. It talks about Jesus as a king. Mark was the faithful and true Gospel. It talks about him being faithful and true, written to the Romans. Bless you. John talks about the Word of God. Remember? And then Luke is enamored with the human aspect of Jesus, so he's the son, the son of God. So that's kind of how those map. Okay, uh, the iron rod. You think uh, Christ is going to rule as a democracy? You think there's going to be voting there? No. No. So, we're going to like it, but it ain't going to be a democracy. It's going to be ruled right, and it's going to be ruled just, and it's going to be ruled far firmly, right? I think what, what did we say uh, before, like with Jesus, what, what's that verse? You can either be, you said it on Thursday night, crushed. Fall on the rock or crushed by it. Fall on the rock or crushed by it, right? So, so we, we covered that before. I think that was a key. But um, when it comes to Jesus, you can either fall on the rock of Christ, or you can be crushed by the rock of Christ. It's your choice. Really, only two. Jesus says it's Okay. 17 uh, through 21, we're going to get... Now, before, before you read this, I want you to understand this comes in context. What is going on right now that we just read about with the bride? Y'all been to them before you get dressed up? If you're like me and my wife, it's like the only time we ever get to dance. It's the wedding and the reception and the party. That's what's going on, right? Well, the wedding party and the marriage of the lamb is going on here. What's going on on earth? Let's read about it. Go. Who wants to read? 17 through 21. <laughs> then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the sign by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burned with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Okay? So you see, there's a very stark contrast. We have a wedding supper, right? Jesus, when he, when he left, remember, he said, I won't taste wine again. So you were with me, right? So they're up drinking wine at the marriage supper. And what's happening down here? It's the great supper of the birds, right? So it's the contract. What are you going to pick, right? <coughs> now, who's the first to go into hell? The Antichrist. The beast and the false prophet. Hell is officially open. So when people tell you that, you know, when he went to hell, no, there's a place of torment, but hell hadn't opened until this point in the Bible, specifically. There is a place of torment. We read that before in the parable. So Jesus, and, I mean, of, uh, Lazarus and the rich man, remember that parable? Okay. What's the significance of them getting thrown in the lie versus everyone else being killed? I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I think most people are, you know, die and then they're, you know, they're resurrected. 
judgment. I guess he wanted to make a point that these were so bad he's going to just throw them a lot directly in hell. Um, I, I don't know. It's a good question. I could lie to you and tell you, but I'm not going to. But it's pretty graphic, huh? a lot. Okay, what has changed about Jesus? I put two verses in there. We had a description back in chapter 1, 14, and then we have a description here in 19, 12 of Jesus. What's changed? What do you notice that's different? What was he doing in back, back in chapter 1? Right. He was walking among the lampstands, the seven lampstands. The lampstands represented what? The churches. The churches, right? Okay. Now there's no longer lampstands, right? So now he's in a different role, right? So what's changed about him? Yeah. He's got the sword in his mouth, right? He's got the crowns. Yeah. Well, he has a blazing fire in both descriptions. But, um, but the crowns, the mini crowns, and the um, the name written on it, right? I don't think it described that back in chapter 1. Okay. Let's go on um, to chapter 20. As we get into this, I want to talk about the millennial. Okay, there's a lot of disagreement on this topic. This is kind of like a rapture. You know, you, do you believe in a pre-rapture, a mid-rapture, or a post-rapture, post-trip, right? Pre-trip, mid-trip, or post-trip, right? Kind of the same thing. There's three viewpoints on the millennium. I'm going to try to walk you through these three. This is another one where there's a little bit of room here if you want to believe one versus the other. I think there's a right answer, and I'll tell you how I believe. There's lots of people that disagree, and, you know, if you choose to, your business. I wouldn't have a theological argument if someone's, you know, hard set on one of these. Um, but nonetheless, I want to go through the three of them. Um, Post-millennialism. Post-millennialism essentially takes this as a literal period on earth that's ushered in by the church. So this viewpoint, which I think is probably the weakest of them, in my opinion, says that we're going to be so good at what we do through the power of Christ that we're going to evangelize the whole world, and then once we finally succeed in evangelizing the whole world and we send everybody through the you know, the tip of the spear and all these people, you know, getting everybody to convert to Christ, then we're going to usher in the millennium by our own efforts, Christ through us. Okay? That's essentially Now, how many of you think we're going to be able to do that? Yeah. Me neither. Okay? Uh, premillennialism. Premillennialism uh, essentially believes that this is a literal thousand year reign on Christ or on earth of Christ but it will happen after the second coming and it's ushered in and the, this is how I believe okay and this is mainly what we're going to focus on as far as what I'm going to teach on but basically the millennium isn't really possible if you follow the text unless Satan is chained in a way. Because you can't have the perfect millennial with Satan running loose. Now, I don't know about you, but last time I checked, Satan was alive and well and running loose around here. So, if you think that one of these other options is possible, then you must believe that Satan is spiritually chained. For a thousand. Okay? And it's not literal. See, you either believe when you read this millennial section as a literal or you believe as a figurative. 
Now, I will switch gears for a second just so you all understand, but there are some figurative things, like you've heard it said that, and it's in Scripture, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, we all agree that a thousand hills is probably not a thousand direct, right? So that would be a figurative type of approach. So the people that believe in that believe that this thousand is a symbolic kind of thing. The danger is, is if you start going too figuratively and too symbolic, you got nothing standing. So, my interpretation, when in doubt, go literal. Okay? Unless you know for a fact that there is a symbol in another part of the Bible that you can clearly define that it's defined as spiritual or symbolic, then don't go. Okay? That's my problem. Okay, amillennialism. This essentially is the symbolic. They essentially don't believe this is, they don't believe in a literal millennium. They believe it's all symbolic and they'll point typically to a time in the past, like a, um, a season in the church where it grew up and exploded, and they'll say that this was the millennial period for the church. And also the thousand is symbolic, right? So it, it can be from the time the Holy Spirit came, the church age, all the way to the return because Satan has been bound by Christ, right? So if you don't believe in him literally being put in the bottomless pit and it being sealed, which is what we're going to read, then you can say, well, this is spiritual, okay? That's all great, but if I want a sandwich, I want a real sandwich. You know, not like a wish sandwich where you get two slices of bread and wish there was meat in the You know, so I'm more of a literal type of guy. But nonetheless, those are your three viewpoints. Okay. Now, which view do you support? I gave you four points here to test why you think you support these. This is one. Satan has to be removed from the earthly scene for the millennial to really happen, you can't have Satan run it loose. Okay? It's kind of like a baseline. Second, the curse of sin has to be removed. Okay? Do you think there's sin around us still? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I don't think it's now. Then three, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints must occur. Okay? The millennial, don't forget, this is the promise. Who's supposed to reign on the earth? Right. This is their promise. This that they don't they're not promised heaven, they're promised earth. So why would we box them out of their millennial period? Right? So that doesn't make sense. And then fourth, man is tested one final time. See, when man, when we had the Garden of Eden, we were tempted, right? By Satan. So man has never been tested when he wasn't tempted. Right? So this is going to be the perfect scenario and will man survive the test? Right. What do you think? Okay. Uh, a thousand years is mentioned nine times, six times in this chapter. The Old Testament's full of references because it was the focus. Okay. So, in typical fast fashion, somebody want to read the first three verses here of chapter 20? And then I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw them into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Okay. Now, what kind of angel? Because whenever we've seen an angel mentioned, it's typically told us a strong angel, a mighty angel, 
you know, all that. What description do we have of this angel? This is a private. <coughs> I mean, this is this is your low rum, right? Now, it, now this is Cody's view, right? If you read some of the commentary, some of them will tell you that this is Christ coming down. Now, I don't know about you, but when God talks about my Jesus, it's normally a little more descriptive than an angel, right? So I don't believe that particular commentary. But this one says an angel. So to me, this tells me that at this point in time, God has had enough. And Satan's authority and his power is stripped when Christ came down. Remember, Christ came down with them. So his authority and power is gone. And just an ordinary angel just grabs him like it's nothing, right? Okay. Now notice, we, we, this is the mark, right, of the millennial. So what is the category for the millennial to begin if you believe in a literal translation? What has to happen? Satan has to be bound, right? Okay? So the next time somebody tells you, well, you know, well, the millennium's already occurred. Well, when exactly was Satan bound? Because I've seen a lot of sin around here. Satan still, still seems to be loose on me, right? you got to challenge people. you got to make them think, okay? There's a lot of nonsense going on out there when it comes to end times and eschatology because people don't actually read it or understand it. It's very simple if you flow through it and you really dig into it, okay? But the problem is, is people, you know, it's like if you get your teeth, your news from MTV, right? Okay, same type of thing, right? Okay. Why do you set for a short time? Why do you think? I don't know, but I don't want to have a full set up. Okay, well, you're not going to have to worry about that. Okay. He is set free, free one more time for two reasons is you know one is Satan wants to be tested one more time Satan wants to write with all restraints no seals no no witnesses no you know no two witnesses no 144,000 seal he wants a fair fight right with him and Jesus right well he's going to get it right it's not going to end pretty okay that's one. Second is man has to be tested. Man has to be given a choice. A test. Now what most people believe, and I knew this question was going to come up, so thank you for asking that. Um, most people believe is that there is going to be a remnant. There's always a remnant whenever there's any kind of judgment, any kind of thing. So there's going to be a remnant of people that actually make it through this. Okay? God's going to save a remnant, okay, of normal, average humans that actually make it through. Okay, they didn't take, the, they didn't take the seal, you know, the mark of the beast, and they make it through. And think about it: that remnant of humans living in a thousand years with no sin, no tears, no death, no, and they can populate. What do you think is going to happen to the population? It's going to explode, right? There's no death. There's no sin. There, it's going to explode. And these people are going to grow up, and they're going to be in a sinless environment. We're going to be with them. And you think, okay, well, how can people with glorified bodies be with people in regular human bodies? Go back to Jesus. He was in a glorified body for 40 days right next to the human body, right? That's what it's supposedly going to be like. So that these people will be tested one last time because there's no human body. And it's one appointed for a man to die, right? So they're going to be tested. So Satan will be let loose one last time. And what will happen?
Okay. Four through six. Who wants to read? I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with them for a thousand years. Okay. See, a lot of people take this verse um, literal. and but That's why I put your chart here, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. I want to be real clear here so that you don't get confused. Because a lot of people, I think, steal people's hope about the rapture with this verse. They go, well, you're not even raised from the dead until it's done. You know. Which I think is totally out of context. The first resurrection started with the first to be resurrected, which was who? Jesus. Easter, right? That started the first resurrection. Now think about this from God's standpoint. How much grace does God have? Right. So the first resurrection is long. Okay? It's not an instant in time. Okay? It's a long period. It began with Jesus, right? And then it happened again with the rapture, right? Because those people are going to be part of the first resurrection, right? And then the tribulation saints, remember he told them all along, like we had the clip of uh, Shrek, remember donkey in the back seat? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? And God said, no, we're not there yet because my, your number's not complete. Because he wants all those people to be in this first resurrection, right? He wants to give them the opportunity to be in there. So then it has all the tribulation saints. It has all the Old Testament saints, right? Those that died believing that the Messiah was coming. And then Jesus came down three days. He came down and preached to them so that they could come up. And scripture could be true, right? And then so it has the Old Testament saints the tribulation saints, and the church. And that is your first resurrection. Right? Okay? So, I think I've clearly explained that here in your chart. Now, the second resurrection, now, I wanted to go through this because the first resurrection has the beam of seat judgment. We just read that, right? Remember, you're going to stand before Christ and judge because it is appointed once for man to be judged, right? So we're going to judge, but your judgment is going to depend on where you fall. Do you fall on Christ, or do you get crushed by the rock of Christ, <coughs> right? That depends on where you are judged. So the Bema Seat judgment is for the believers. The great white throne judgment is for those that want to be judged. And that's going to be the rest of the dead. It's going to be works based, and they're all going to go to the lake of fire. Okay? There's no one that's going to pass the white throne of judgment. It's not possible. Right? So, <clears throat> what's going on? Seven through nine. Two and three. <clears throat> When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to the three nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sands on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loved. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Okay, now who are all these people that are like seeds of the sand shore? Sand. Say that ten times. <laughs> like the sands of the sea, right? That are marching against God. 
Well, they can't be the resurrected saints, right? They're in glorified bodies. They can't be the church. We're in glorified bodies. We're sinless. They can't be the Old Testament saints because they're glorified. So who is it? Right. It's those people. It's the question you asked earlier. See, the answer is there. The answer is here if we just study. Right? So they're going to be deceived one last time. Right? So, so, so out of the need we created and lived who knows how long but without any sort of experience with other people and then they were deceived. And these people grew up their whole lives surrounded by all these believers and everything. And, and Jesus and is out. Yeah. And then they get deceived. And furthermore, you know, it's like a generation thing, right? Because the people that actually went through and saw the Great Tribulation and lived through it and saw it, it's like the people that crossed and saw God split the sea, you know, and told it to their kids, you know, and three generations go past to get them. I don't believe that old story, my grandpa. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, Revelation twenty ten. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. There you go. All right. How long have we waited for that? What a great day that will be, huh? The devil thrown into the lake of fire. So who's third in hell? You now have the order, right? Yeah. Okay. So the devil is... Where is the devil today? He's the prince of the power of the air here, right? Okay. When people tell you that, Where's the devil today? You know his title today, and you know his destination, and the order in which he goes. Right? Okay. Um, Revelation twenty eleven. Let's go twenty eleven through thirteen. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead was judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. The death and he gave up the dead that were with were in them. And each person will judge according to what they had done. Okay. So what do you have here? You have the books versus the book of life. What are the books? Everything you've ever done. Right. How frightful would that be? Could you imagine? You know, they'd open up the books. Mine would be that thick, you know. And they'd be opening it through and be going, okay, okay you're ready to stand. I wouldn't get past page one, right? So, God makes the choice really clear, right? I mean, you even see the scene, right? The great white throne, what does it say? It said it was, what did it say at the beginning? <coughs> the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. I mean, this is frightful, right? I mean, the earth and the heavens are fleeing, and the person has to stand. And there's going to be a book of life right here next to them. And they will have known, or they will have seen or heard about Jesus at one point in their life and said no. And they're going to be looking at those two books, knowing the decision they made.
I like how it illustrates it's one book of life because not much has to be said, just your right. name in it, versus the books mm. written. Yeah. Pretty amazing. And you notice uh, the sea gave up the dead, Hades gave up the dead that were in it, right? Hades is the temporary hell before hell is open, right? So that was paradise and Hades that we had in the Old Testament. Okay, so if you see those terms, Hades sometimes is used synonymous with hell, but it's a place of torment, but it's not really the lake of fire. The lake of fire is Um, you know, this gets back to our basic, you know, uh, evangelism, right? Anybody do the way of the master, right? You do the Ten Commandments. You do Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? You take them down the Roman road, this is exactly what this is, except this is all right for us. Okay. 14.15, who wants to read? The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So, what is thrown in along with all those people? Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about this, there's a great parable, uh, the one we referenced here, Lazarus and the rich man, and that's in Luke 16, I'll put the reference there for you. Um, it also references our darkness, some of those parables. I mean, how dark is our darkness? I mean, darkness isn't bad enough, it's our darkness, right? like the back side of the desert, right? Okay. Guess what next week is? Mm -hmm.